please stand as you are able for hymn number 34, our opening hymn, Though I May Speak with Bravest Fire. A quote from the Dalai Lama. Love and compassion are necessities, not luxuries. Without them, humanity cannot survive. We light this chalice symbolic of the warmth of community and brightness that love brings to the world, illuminating our search for justice and peace. Light, the force that nurtures all living things here in our midst, in this flame, so tiny and so significant. Welcome everybody to uh, a beautiful Sunday morning in July. The weather's cooperating finally this month. Um, Welcome to the Universalist Unitarian Church of Farmington. I'm John Benarowitz of the Building and Grounds Committee. Our minister, the Reverend Leonetta Buglesi, is out of the pulpit today, and today's special guest speaker is uh, Frederick Glacier, whom I will introduce more of uh, uh, at the time. I uh, would like to welcome all visitors today, a special welcome. Uh, please join us after the service in the lower level for coffee hours. Um, There'll be someone there uh, manning the new members table if you have questions. During the service also we have supervised nursery for babies and toddlers. Um, and uh, if you have any questions about that, that's uh, located on the lower level, one of the ushers can show you. Um, should you need to leave the service for any reason, there are two other locations within the building that are broadcasting, simulcasting the service. Uh, ushers can also direct you the, to those um, if you need them. Our UU principles begin with our pledge to affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of all people. As we are a welcoming congregation, we welcome into our community people of all races, sexual orientations, belief systems, and ages including any who are fidgety and create youthful noises. These little humans represent our future and we welcome them fully in our meeting house. Have a couple of announcements today, um, one of which at least is uh, in, mentioned in your 
order of service. We have the our church picnic in two weeks, two weeks from today, um, on the 28th, following the service over in uh, in Shiawassee Park. Um, and Liz has an announcement about the Founders Parade next week. Good morning. Good morning. So, as you know, um, I was up here a couple weeks ago <coughs> encouraging and taking orders for T-shirts. T-shirts should be uh, delivered by Tuesday. I, uh, for those of you that ordered shirts, uh, you should have gotten an email from me, but we are looking for people to march in the Founders Parade. We are also looking for maybe a couple volunteers to help shuttle walkers from the end of the route back to the staging area. Um, the parade itself, even if you're not walking and you want to come uh, support us, the parade itself kicks off at 10 o'clock in the morning next Saturday, this coming Saturday, the 20th, in downtown Farmington. It uh, comes up Grand River um, from Power Street to Liberty Street, so right through downtown. Uh, we'll be walking. We're looking to get a group of like 20 to 30 people to walk. And I put an order in for 83 shirts, so 20 to 30 people walking should be totally doable. Um, we have, we're going to carry, of course, the church banner that we used when we, uh, I know some people walked from the old location of the church, the former location, to the new location a couple years ago, so we have that. And then we have a new banner that will have our mission statement on it, so that everybody can see our nice and easy to see mission statement. So um, if you're interested in walking or you're interested in shuttling, please see me after service. Um, otherwise, if you're not involved in the parade or don't want to be, but you ordered a shirt, I will have them next Sunday uh, to pass out to anybody who's here. So, and if you guys have any questions on shirts, parades, what have you, either part, see me downstairs. <laughs> Thank you, Liz. Um, and uh, for this next part, him blue boat home. I'm queuing. I'm looking at Liz and queuing her because she's going to lead us. Liz is going to. Thank you, Linda. Uh, 1064 in your blue hymnal. Thanks, Linda. Um, stand as you are able. Liz is going to actually lead and uh, sing the first verse, and then we'll do all three uh, after she's done with the first.
feel I missed my opportunity to remind everyone of Leonetta's preference for swaying. That was definitely a swaying song. I forgot to cue us all. <laughs> but uh, that was the one. I should have picked up on it. We have a great deal more kindness than is ever known. The whole human family is bathed with an element of love, like a fine ether. How many persons we meet in houses whom we scarcely speak to, whom yet we honor and who honor us. Read the languages of these wandering eye beams, the heart knoweth. A perfect heart is one that has known love and loss, joy and sorrow. The perfect heart is one that has been shared. You are all invited to share uh, your name and a joy or sorrow as we gather in our hearts of perfection. We, as the beloved community, direct our energy, prayers, and meditation to you as our gift of compassion and strength. Um, if you have a joy or sorrow to share at this time, we can come forward and light a candle.
for our offering. We give generously to support this church where love, justice, and equality inspire our acts of service and compassion. We dedicate these gifts to all that we stand for within the Unitarian Universalist tradition. <laughs> And uh, before uh, Fred comes up, I'd like to give you a little bit of uh, bio on our guest speaker today, and uh, uh, so we know a bit more about him. Frederick Glacier, our guest speaker today, is an epic poet, rhapsode, poet critic, and the author, editor of 10 books. Uh, in 1977, Mr. Glacier had a theater course in the interpretive reading of poetry. In this, he learned that the rhapsodes would travel throughout ancient Greece reciting Homer. And before long, the idea of writing an epic poem became compelling and the dream that one day he might also revive the storytelling art of the rhapsode. Uh, Mr. Glacier has given more than 30 epic poetry readings, uh, including at Wayne State's Hillary Theater and uh, multiple other uh, Unitarian church locations. As well, uh, if some of you may remember or know that uh, one of our own members, Jeff Tamakis, uh, directed and rehearsed a play earlier this spring, which was entirely written by Mr. Glacier. Uh, it was from the, uh, his book, The Parliament of Poets, and they adapted that for a play. Um, also, I'd make note, and there'll be some copies back if notice, uh, a second performance of it with Jeff's troupe is being done in Ann Arbor in the fall. Uh, there'll be copies back there. So, um, without further ado, Mr. Frederick Glacier. I'd like to thank Reverend Leonetta for inviting me to speak this morning and accepting my sermon on Tolstoy's universality. And I want to th take this opportunity to th thank her again, uh, although she's not here, but, uh, and the Unitarian Universalist Congregation here of Farmington uh, for allowing member Jeff Tamakis, my theater group, uh, Apollo's Troupe, to rehearse the theater version of my epic poem, The Parliament of Poets, in April and May. Uh, I'm here today because while we were rehearsing, I noticed on the turnstile in the, in the uh, lobby here a copy of Leo Tolstoy's A Calendar of Wisdom, full subtitle, Daily Thoughts to Nourish the Soul, written and selected from the world's sacred texts. Uh, as someone whose whole life has been given to poetry and literature and study of world religions, I have had a long interest in Tolstoy beginning really in the mid-1970s and have written a few essays on him in my book, The Myth of the Enlightenment, 
Uh, I've long had a copy of Tolstoy's A Calendar of Wisdom. So I was, I was struck to see it here in the lobby, which naturally led me to th start thinking about the book again, uh, especially since in late April I had delivered a sermon at uh, Gross Point Unitarian Church uh, about Kenneth Patton's book, some might know, a, a Religion for One World, about his experimental universalist church in Boston during the mid to late 1950s. First, I'll provide a little background uh, for understanding Tolstoy and a calendar of wisdom. Second, read several selections from it, meditations. And then third, I'll end uh, with a short passage uh, with Tolstoy as a character in my epic poem uh, talking about love. Leo Tolstoy was, along with Walt Whitman, one of the earliest modern writers to begin to understand the world was evolving toward universality. And what that would look like and mean. Part of what helped Tolstoy in his intellectual and spiritual struggle was, was the Unitarian and Universalist traditions of a moderate spiritual, uh, spirituality represented by such early ministers and writers as William Ellery Channing, Theodore Parker, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Aidan Ballou, and the abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison, who wasn't a Unitarian, uh, most of whom Tolstoy quotes repeatedly in A Calendar of Wisdom. As he does elsewhere in his writings, such as in his 1894 book, The Kingdom of God is Within You. Tolstoy began thinking about compiling a collection of religious and wisdom teachings in about 1895, putting it through several editions with various titles, its final edition not published until after his death in 1910. In another intimately related book of 1908, The Law of Love and the Law of Violence, Tolstoy sums up best what all his efforts were about. Quote, the ancient religions all recognized love as an essential condition of a happy existence. The sages of Egypt, the Brahmins, the Stoics, the Buddhists declared the principal virtues to be kindness, pity, compassion, and charity. In one word, love in all its forms. The highest of these doctrines, especially those of Buddha and Lao Tzu, recommended love for all living things and for people to return good for evil. End quote. Tolstoy affirms an open and universal conception of Christianity, seeking to unite all traditions and peoples with what he calls quote, the supreme law of love, end quote. Explaining further that, the true Christian doctrine, making of the law of love a rule permitting no exceptions, in this way rules out the possibility of, of any violence and cannot in consequence help but condemn all regimes which are founded on it, alluding to Christ's nonviolent admonition to love your enemies, as in Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 to 8. According to Tolstoy's own account, much of what inspired and kept him working on both books, a calendar of wisdom and the law of love and the law of violence, was his sense of the continuing upheavals of the Russian society under the Tsar and then the radical movements that ultimately culminated in the 1917 Communist Revolution. Both the czarist and communist regimes conspired to suppress Tolstoy's writings and were successful at preventing him from reaching a wider readership. First under the czars, Tolstoy was constantly spied on and his publications were censored, often with significant portions deleted. Since the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1989, it has become known that the old czarist archives hold copies of all his writings during the last 30 years of his life, many secretly provided by 
Vladimir Chertkov, the man whom Tolstoy regarded as a friend and entrusted with publishing all his uh, writings in Russia and in England. Under the Tsar, the law of love and the law of violence was heavily censored in his 1909 publication and only appeared in the West in two small journals in England and France, never seeing the light of day again until 1917. But then only in a small periodical read by almost no one. Under the Soviet Union, it remained suppressed until 1956, when it was published and basically buried in the 28 volumes of his collected works. Only after the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1989 were there separate editions of a calendar of wisdom and uh, in Russia, and incredibly not even in the United States until 1997. The small and poorly translated early editions that appeared in England and France were largely misunderstood by the few readers who they reached. A full and properly translated edition of the Law of Love and Law of Violence also didn't appear in the West until 1970 and is still little known or read. Both regimes were very different from one another, yet each found Tolstoy's supreme law of love so threatening that they suppressed it. Each sensed that it was and is a superior vision of life compared to any merely political regime. The British Arnold Toynbee wrote in his study of the collapse of 24 different major world civilizations that he found evidence in 18 of them of people who were attempting to help them to change peacefully and resolve the issues they were confronted with, but like Tolstoy, were stymied in their efforts in reaching the whole society. Despite all that, nearly 100 years of suppression, an Indian scholar has described Tolstoy as a major influence on Gandhi's Satyagraha, or nonviolent resistance, and thereby, I'd say, even on Martin Luther King Jr. What I wish to convey is that Tolstoy's universality of spirituality and the law of love precede and foreshadow liberal and more open and universal interpretations of Christianity and world religions that have evolved during the last hundred years or so, largely without his two most profound books on spirituality, and despite what has come to be the dominant modern secular culture. With them, I believe, many of the conflicts that divide people could be significantly healed and resolved. Largely, the nonviolent efforts of Tolstoy, Gandhi, and King were essentially localized now they need to be, can be, globalized and are precisely what the world needs to survive the many issues that confront us. The choice of much of modernity to, to interpret life in extremely secular, rigid terms has taken humanity out of harmony with its own history and nature and is at the root of many of our continuing problems on this planet. In many ways, modernity has made the wrong choice, that we have thrown out the baby with the bathwater, so to speak, becomes ever more clear. More than enough historical experience has been suffered to prove its inadequacy. More hyper-rationalism, materialism, even various kinds of tyranny and fascism some are flirting with are the wrong elixir to heal the wound. We're sinking under the weight and confusion of dehumanizing, mechanical, formalistic ideas and abstractions when what is needed is the spiritual experience of prayer, meditation, contemplation, and a moderate universal reinterpretation and affirmation of the spiritual oneness of human beings and the great religions and cultures at the deepest levels of mystical experience and consciousness. That is not to advocate any backward movement or return to traditional exclusivisms and doctrines. Such recognition of the universality of world religion could provide more of a stabilizing tradition for America and the world, 
much more than the dominant relativism and nihilism which often leave the social space vulnerable and undefended from extremists of every stripe, whether religious, secular, or political. The liberal Unitarian Universalist tradition, in ways unlike any other, runs very long and deep into American history and culture, indeed, world culture, and has repeatedly demonstrated its capacity for change when needed. As early as the 1820s, Unitarian missionaries in Kolkata, India, had extensive contacts with such Indian liberals as Ram Mohan Roy, the family of Rabindranath Tagore, and others who were striving to find and create a modern, universal reinterpretation of Indian spirituality, running all the way forward to the 1893 Parliament of World Religions in, in Chicago, and even into the 20th century, all of which I've, I've, I've written about in, in my book, The Myth of the Enlightenment, too. Growing up in a family of several Christian denominations, both Catholic and Protestant, I repeatedly had the experience at family holidays of fierce arguments into which my mother would step shouting, enough, we're here to celebrate the holiday as a family, and uh, let us celebrate life together. As the Indian Rig Veda has it, Truth is one, sages call it by many names. A high school class in world religions in the early 1970s inspired my lifelong interest in world religions, uh, which I've pursued through independent study, uh, university coursework, and so forth, taught world religions at college level. For more than a decade, I've visited over 60 churches mosques, synagogues, Jain and Hindu temples, Sikh gurdwaras, Buddhist sanghas, and other houses of worship through my own inner urging, urging and with the Troy Area Interfaith Group, far from the conventional sense of traditionally divisive dogma and doctrine uh, religion, we human beings need to recognize more of the unity of all spiritual traditions at the deepest level, especially when it comes to love. Astonishingly, astonishingly, in these two books, at the end of his life, Tolstoy arrived there largely ahead of all of us. They still hold a much needed vision of a peaceful world built on the impregnable foundation of our common humanity. The modern effort seeking universality reaches throughout Unitarian and Universalist traditions and far beyond them. It's the longing of the human heart for the deepest intimations of consciousness and being. Far from the exclusivisms of the past or the exclusivism of scientism and the Enlightenment ideology, universality is ever more the experience of our daily lives, even as retrograde forces in every culture around the globe attempt to turn backwards to orthodoxies and theocracies that seek to dominate entire cultures and control every minute aspect of the individual's life. All the more reason that a reassessment of the cultural landscape we homo sapiens on this planet have created is needed and a reaffirmation of universality. The great mystics and practitioners of all traditions, Christian, Buddhist, otherwise, emphasized that re religion was not merely a building, a creed, or a social group, but an experience in the innermost heart and soul of the individual where the peace that passeth understanding uh, truly resides and which provides upon return to ordinary life the motivating energy for a meaningful life, social justice, brotherly love, and peace. To save ourselves from the crises that confront our time, we human beings must recover the universality of the spiritual and sacred and the incalculable power of love, not violence. Tolstoy's title, A Calendar of Wisdom, 
clearly alludes to the custom of the medieval book of hours, which had a prayer or meditation for each appointed time of the day. Tolstoy usually has five or six short paragraphs from various sources for each day. To give a taste of the calendar of wisdom, I'm going to read several of them. For and they're uh, all by uh, day, uh, dates of the calendar. For January 10th, William Eller, the Unitarian minister William Ellery Channing is quoted, quote, I think that the major obligation of parents and education is to give children an understanding of the divine beginning that exists within them. January 12th, Ralph Waldo Emerson, we are all like children who first repeat the unquestionable truth told to us by our grandmothers, then the truth told to us by our teachers, and then when we become older, the truth told to us by prominent people. January 23rd, Socrates, an evil person damages not only others, but himself. Tw January 25th, the Buddhist book, the Dhammapada. Only in yourself, only in your impersonal self, can you find the eternal. April 17th, the Unitarian mis minister, Theodore Parker. Christianity is a very simple thing. Love other persons as you love God. May 5th, the Jewish Talmud. You should always be truthful, especially with a child. You should always do what you promised him. Otherwise, you will teach him to lie. August 17th, Confucius. No matter how much goodness you do, you should wish to do more and more. April 18th, the 18th century German playwright Gotthold Ephraim Lessing, author of a brilliant play, incidentally, now at Stratford Festival in Canada, Nathan the Wise, quote, religion is true not because it was taught by the saints. The saints taught it because it is true. September 25th, Henry David Thoreau, it is not enough to be a hardworking person. Think, what do you work at? <laughs> October 13th, Lao Tzu. In those countries where wise people are in power, their subjects do not notice the existence of their leaders. October 17th, Tolstoy himself, the religious conscience of mankind is not rigid, it is changing all the time, becoming purer and clearer. Lastly here, William Ellery Channing for October 27th again, do not believe that in religion you must, you, uh, do not believe that in religion you cannot trust your intellect. The force of our intellect must support the foundations of every real faith. These two great works by Tolstoy are part of the vision that humanity still needs, that the Unitarian tradition contributed significantly to Tolstoy's understanding of modern religion needs to be recognized more than it has been. Perhaps that could help Tolstoy's law of love become more the law of the world. In closing, I'll read a brief passage from my epic poem set partly on the moon at the Apollo 11 landing site with Tolstoy speaking to the main character, the poet of the moon. Look at me. The crevasse opened and swallowed everything. Poor mother Russia. I grieve with all my heart. I know I was wrong on many things, but not that the collapse was coming. I tried to warn them, even as anarchy also led me astray. I admit it that even a free thinker, such as myself, ended up too literal about the Bible. Me, the heretic. But about love, I was never wrong. Cling to love. It is the golden rule of God himself. The ancients, the truest gold. The only worth having, giving life to all. Up 
there from the moon, I would think you should be able to see it clearly. God's love encircling humanity. Thank you, Fred. We don't often get applause here, so that was, uh, that was terrific. Um, please uh, stand and join me in singing, and I, I really don't know who chooses the music here, but they're challenging my German knowledge, <laughs> which is none. I'm going to call it Die Gedanken sind frei. And those educated can tell me later if I was close or not. <laughs> To close, a quote from Thomas Carlyle. A loving heart is the beginning of all knowledge. <laughs>